thank you so much for coming. Um, I know Tuesdays at 2 p.m. are kind of hard to juggle meetings, appointments, teaching, nap times. So I appreciate you coming out today um, to hear me talk. And thank you, Kelly, because you're fabulous and you actually said my last name correctly, Vagalus. So props to you. Thank you for that. Okay, so today, um, my uh, presentation was titled Queer Brides and Lonely Swains, American Picture Brides and the Effects of Marriage, Race, and the Family on U.S. Immigration Policy. When I showed that to my little brother, he's like, you really need to shorten your titles. <laughs> um, but I like it. My field loves the, like, the colon and dramatic um, exit there. Um, but it's descriptive of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to start off a little bit talking about my contributions to the Heracom Gallery over here. Um, then I'm going to do maybe a little bit of family history sprinkled in there, and then that we're going to transition into what I do um, for my dissertation. I'm a PhD candidate over in American Studies. And the main idea here that I want to um, articulate through this example of picture bride women, and I'll explain who those women are here in a second, um, is that the United States... Um, has always precipiced its, um, or predicated rather, its immigration policies, its strategies on handling immigrants, um, welcoming or either disparaging immigrants based on a complex system of race, of gender, of sexuality. And so many things in our lexicon, in our daily lives, our dialogues, um, seem to be common sense, right? We accept them, like, what is it to be American? Well, we have this nebulous idea that we just kind of accept as truth. Or what is whiteness? What does it mean to be white? What does it mean to be non-white, et cetera? And so what's interesting about this history is it takes place early 20th century before the United States really had any concrete immigration restrictions or laws. And so it's coming in a time period where they're scrambling to figure out who these people are, right? Because there's mass immigration that starts coming in the 19th century. You have waves of Irish immigrants coming in. Late 19th century, you have waves of Chinese migrants coming in the West. Um, and by the early 20th century, you have all sorts of Europeans coming in as well. Um, so first, um, let's jump into my Heracom gallery pieces, <clears throat> and pardon me, um, and what um, I, well, first of all, um, the whole gallery over here um, is talking about immigration in a way that celebrates creativity and how migration spurs creativity and shapes it in really unique, wonderful ways. Um, and celebrating some of the hardships as well as some of the joys of that movement and starting over. Um, so my uh, family, on my dad's side, um, comes from Greece on both of his lines. And um, the first thing I brought, and I have it over here too on the piano, and then in the cases over here, it's um, used as sort of a backdrop, like they photographed it really beautifully and it's on the bottom of the cases. Um, this is a tapestry that my great-grandma um, Anastasia um, actually made herself. She's from um, Piraeus, which is, where am I at here? It's like near Athens, sort of like on the coast. Um, and she lived on a farm. She grew up on a farm. And um, was it Monty? I think it might be Monty. I think it's Monty. Yeah, my dad's in the audience, so I had to check that really quick. She grew up in Monty. Um, and my grandma later moved to Piraeus and then Athens. Anyway. So this was handmade on a loom. So she grew up on this farm. She sheared the sheep. She spun the wool. She dyed it herself with dyes available um, from Athens. You could go to the city and buy them. And then literally sat on a loom, uh, a, a loom rather, um, and created this herself. And this was actually for her dowry because Greek women would create like all of um, all the bedding, the sheets, the um, tablecloths, whatever you needed for the marriage life you would bring with you and the husband would provide like the house, right? Or other things. Um, so she made this around 1915. So like all of that beautiful, bright, like purpley indigo blue um, is actually like well over a hundred years old, which is amazing. And how this sort of fits into this idea about creativity and migration is in 1949, when my grandmother, Calliope, comes over to America, this is one of the few things she brings with her in her suitcase, right? And so um, when she comes over here, here's, um, this would have been her husband's aunt, Kula, 
Um, and that's her daughter. That's my Aunt Tess right there in front. Um, and so once Calliope gets here, um, she, uh, taking all of this knowledge of crochet that she grew up with, this needlework, right, that she learned from her mother, who passed away when she was a little girl, too. Um, she sat with women, her, like, new in-laws, her new friends, right? And that was a way of bonding. It was a way of sharing domestic labor. It was a way of getting to know each other. And this is a tablecloth. It's also over there. Um, that was made... Um, by the women. So Kula would make these little um, circles here, then pass them off to Calliope, who would make like the scallops around it, and then somebody else would connect them all together. So when you're looking at these pieces, it's not just a tablecloth. It is hours and hours of women sitting around, sharing, bonding, um, discussing their issues, their children, their husbands, whatever, right? And what is going on, and, and, and let me go to the next thing here too. Um, and I have a piece of it. Let me grab my back, because this is kind of neat. If I can find it. Okay, well, I can't find the little piece of it. But I do have a spool of thread, if you want to pass this around, that you can see just, this is like so fine, right? Um, I tried myself to make a little something as an example. It's so hard. My hands, I'm already kind of shaky just as a person, not necessarily nerves, um, but it's just so hard to get such an intricate work done. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about the significance here in a second. Um, these, and you can see it hung up from the ceiling over there. Um, this one, the birds here, and also these flowers that are on the piano over here. Um, were made, were hand embroidered by my grandma's sister who stayed behind in Athens. And they for years, like even up until the 90s uh, before um, her sister passed away, they would send back and forth tapestries, they would send forth things that they made, right? And they're just tokens of affection um, to sister to sister across seas. This one was one that her sister had made when they were little girls in Athens. Um, and it was sort of like, I remember this, you know, like, so this is actually an important sweet little piece that she made when she was a little girl. So this is probably from the 1920s. And so um, the importance of all of this is that women's work matters in history. Um, and their reproductive and their domestic labor are not just a, an important aspect of the economy, of global economies, national economies, local economies, but that they are a transmission of culture and memories. So I never got to meet my um, great grandma, but I have literally her work that I can hold in my hands. Um, she never learned to read. She didn't go to school. A lot of women in Greece in the early 20th centuries either didn't go to school or never learned to read. My grandmother, because of uh, World War II and the communist um, sort of uprising right after the war, um, has a fourth grade education. She can read um, and she's done well for herself. But these are not typically people that you would hail in the academy or were celebrated sort of in this ivory tower that we exist in. Um, and so it's really amazing that we can have these legible pieces of their lives, right, that we can actually hold in our hands and see them um, and recognize their value and their worth. And then the, finally, um, the last one is uh, one that I worked on with my grandmother. And my grandma can spin quite the story. <laughs> So this represents hours of working with her, and um, it's uh, Tunisian crochet, and then all the colored pieces, you go back in with yarn and you cross-stitch yourself. And I love crochet. So this is, I actually, this is my Instagram. It's crochet <laughs> underscore unicorn. Um, and uh, I do blankets, and this is actually a Jayhawk unicorn. I thought that would be appropriate to share. <laughs> Uh, but my grandmother, through these women in my line all the way back to villages in Greece, have sort of translated and passed on these memories, these stories, um, and this women's work. So I'm very proud of it, actually. And so there's that. Um, so bridging into what I do for a living, I started um, the grad program in American Studies, and I knew that I wanted to do something with immigration, given my family history. Um, and so I started a class where it was just a readings course, and my professor assigned a lot of different books. One of them was Issei Nisei War Bride by Evelyn Nakano Glenn. It's fabulous. 
It's very interesting, a very accessible read. Um, and in it, so Issei means first generation, Nisei means second generation, and then the war brides are the women who are coming after um, World War II predominantly. Um, but these Issei women, a lot of them were picture brides coming over. And picture brides um, mean women who are in arranged marriages who come to the United States um, to marry or meet Japanese men for the first time. And why they do this is in 1907, um, there's something called the Gentleman's Agreement, where Japan, it's not a law because the United States wanted to be really tricky, tricky and diplomatic. They didn't want to make Japan um, mad because Japan is coming up as a world power right after the Russo-Japanese War, right? And so but they also, because of all of the white nativism that exists in the United States, especially the U.S. West, because so much um, economic competition over labor and resources, right, which always gets hyped up, um, they had an agreement with Japan where Japan agreed to stop issuing passports to certain classes. of Japanese, very loud steam whistle, um, certain classes of Japanese labor. So it made it really hard um, to get out of the country and it really made it really hard to get back in um, unless, and, and a lot of people were afraid, so men going back home were afraid that they couldn't get back into the United States. That's what I meant. So this loophole though caused um, a family reunification allowance um, in it and so women would get married to men by proxy. So there would be ceremonies where like a picture would stand in or like a brother would stand in as a representative. And it was based on arranged marriages, which have been a huge part of so many cultures for so, like centuries, millennia, right? Um, and so it's like a, it's a form of traditional arranged marriage that just happens to be across seas and allows women to come into the United States to migrate, to form families for new opportunities, right? Um, and so it's clever because it's sort of subverting these like strict racist xenophobic restrictions on their lives, right? Um, and so I loved this history, but it was not surprising because um, Greeks also have a history of picture brides. Um, I have one back in my line on my grandpa's side and my grandma in 1949, I mentioned she came over with this in her suitcase. She came over because right after the war, um, again, the communist revolution is sort of happening in Greece. It's bloody. There is a lot of dangerous stuff going on. Um, the country is kind of devastated with the infrastructure. There's food shortages, etc. And there's a woman in Athens who says, I have uh, a cousin in America, Basilios. He goes by Bill, or he went by Bill. Um, and so they sort of wrote letters back and forth. I don't know how extensive that correspondence was. I don't think that it was that extensive. Um, but Grandma, Yaya, the Greek word for Grandma, um, comes over, flies into New York, meets Bill for the first time, and they end up getting married um, in Lincoln, Nebraska, where my dad and his siblings all grew up. And there's actually like a really cool Greek community um, in Lincoln for a long time. Um, and so it shows up in the um, newspaper in 1949, in the Lincoln Journal Star, airmail romance climaxed by simple wedding here. And it's sort of like romantic. It's talking about the lovers who had this correspondence across seas. And it's really kitsch. And at the very end, it asks, like through a translator, because the brown eyed beauty doesn't speak English, right? Through a translator, the reporter asks her, what about a honeymoon? And she giggles and apparently says, I think America's enough honeymoon, which is this sort of like, it's just ripe for deconstruction, right? What is America as a honeymoon? Is it like a nightmare? Is it a dream? What is, what is it? So, um, and this is my grandma and her family. That's my grandpa, right? Um, and so I know from personal history that these picture brides that were so uh, persecuted in the early 20th century um, and eventually excluded, like the practice was stopped by 1920 in something called the Ladies' Agreement, right? Like the Gentlemen's Agreement in 1907. So the Ladies' Agreement stops this migration of women coming in by 1920. Meanwhile, you have these Southern European women, these Italian, these Armenian women, these Greek women, even German and Spanish women coming over as picture brides well until at least 1949, right? 
And so um, this is when I started looking into this history, and I really wanted to know why certain histories get forgotten or are excluded out of um, historical memory, um, and why certain things stick with certain groups. Why is it that Picture Bride sticks with Japanese women, and the stigma of picture marriage sticks with Japanese women while it sort of gets brushed under the rug, or forgotten, or seen as something kitsch and an airmail romance, right, in other groups. Um, and so important to this time period, and I will say that it very much has to do with race, but it is not as simple as one group is white, one group is non-white. If it was that simple, it would be excellent, because I would write that on a piece of paper, and I would submit it, and I would get my PhD, and be done, and get <laughs> tenure automatically at a great university. No, very much more complex than that. Um, because in this time period, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, eugenics is starting to flourish in the United States. And it's racial science, right? We see it as pseudoscience now, because we have debunked it. Um, but in the time period, it is actually considered um, a uh, legitimate um, way of life or a way of thinking about society. <laughs> and the whole idea behind eugenics is that um, genet or eugenics is that genetics matter, right? That you need to have proper breeding, that whites need to um, uh, marry and procreate with other <laughs> exceptional whites so that you can continue on um, with this body politic, right? And it's very steeped in nationalism, according to like different countries as well. Um, and it's all about uh, keeping disabled people from procreating. There's like laws saying you can, uh, Buck v. Bell for, in 1927 later says you can um, sterilize uh, people with either mental disabilities or physical disabilities without their consent, and that was totally constitutional, right? That comes out of eugenics. Um, and it was about keeping non-white reproduction down, right? Because they are seen as sort of like pollutants to um, society and to their um, genetic lines. And it goes as far, and I don't know if people really know this history, but it goes as far in 1911, because they're trying to like sort of figure out immigration restrictions and who all these people are that are coming in to the country, the United States government actually like pays money to have a congressional committee have this big project, and they produce a dictionary of races or peoples, and you can find it online. And it literally goes like Greek, Italian, Hindu, um, Chinese, etc., and it gives like descriptions of what they look like and how they act and all of these like stereotypical things. But it was based purely on who are these people, how can we police them, who should come in and when, right? Um, and we even had Madison Grant who writes The Passing of the Great Race, which is literally talking about degenerating racial influences on the white Anglo population. Um, and does anybody know who was deeply influenced by this book and called it his Bible? What did you say? Hitler. Yeah, Hitler. So Adolf Hitler. So a lot of people don't realize just how um, influential American eugenics was to Nazi Germany and Nazi science. Um, and connected to eugenics at the same time is sexology. And sexology is the science of sex and sexual acts and procreation. Um, and in this time period, late 19th century, is when you have these ideas of homosexuality and heterosexuality coalescing. So again, these knowledges that we have in our brain, we know the word homosexual and it's, we've known it our entire lives and it's just a thing, right? Well, at some point in our histories, all of these ideas develop and become significant. So in this time period, like same-sex sex, sex um, was not just seen as an act, but it was pathologized, right? All of a sudden, the scientific community wanted to know what it meant about individuals who would do um, certain things or act a certain way. Gender inversion, um, uh, which is a woman who acts manly or a man who acts feminine, um, was also part of this. And it was deeply connected to deviancy. Um, yeah, which is, like, there's so much of this history that I want to talk about. Um, but I will just um, sort of sum it up with the fact 
that eugenics and sexology are intricately tied because they both have to do, again, with genetics, sexuality, reproduction, right, and sexology, talking about deviancy, and it's very flooded with ideas of white, middle-class sexuality and respectability. And so what you have is a lot of sexual stereotypes that are heaped onto non-white people or immigrants. And this is an example I got out of Dave Rodiger's, one of Dave Rodiger's books. I can't tell you which one at the moment. Um, but, uh, and I can't, no, anyway, going on here. Um, but it's very phallic, right? Sexualized, it's supposed to be. Um, this is an Irish immigrant um, and a Chinese immigrant eating um, Uncle Sam. Um, Chinese immigrants, there's this whole history of feminizing them, right, in order to make them perverse or deviant, etc. And that was a very specific political strategy to take away legitimacy from them, um, etc. Um, but part of so this is where this is where we're headed back to picture rights. Uh, so part of sexology and eugenics coalescing are new ideas of romance and love in the time period. And this, whereas civilization was sort of the um, the epitome of whiteness and Anglo progress, like a couple decades before, love and romance become these new code words for whiteness. And it's all about um, marriage and family, or it's a microcosm of democracy, right? Um, with uh, marriages, it's, it used to be um, Victorian ideas of women's piety and chastity, right, were valued above all else. And as we're approaching into the early 20th century, into the 1920s, where we have flappers, right, um, like increasing sexual liberalization of white women, um, women are allowed to have sexual feelings and to express it, right? And so there's these new ideas about marriage and love and romance is a choice. You choose your partners, um, and it's mutually erotic between the two of you. There's desire there, and that this choice is essential to not just families but American life. Because as a microcosm of democracy, it's about egalitarianism, about um, like somewhat about equality, right? Because we're still having all sorts of arguments about women's suffrage, et cetera. Um, but it's about um, equality, um, uh, egalitarianism, free choice, democracy, whatever. And we can go on and on and on about that. Um, but there is all of these marriage pamphlets and sex pamphlets all coming out at the same time to try to talk about this thing. Um, normality as a concept also comes around. So if we're talking about race, we're talking about sexuality, we're talking about marriage and families, there's this new medical concept of normality that says um, a normal healthy body does X, Y, and Z, or has these desires, or acts in these certain ways, etc. So eugenics movements um, and societies <coughs> invested in these ideas of marriage, and this is a eugenics certificate that you could write into and apply for. And if you are like a white person of good breeding who married another white person, Anglo person, we'll, we'll talk about whiteness here, of good breeding, you could um, write in and you could get a certificate for your unusually strong eugenic love possibilities, well fitted to promote the happiness and future welfare of the race. Okay. Um, and uh, other things, like unreliable husbands, because um, phrenology, head shape, was a big part of eugenics. And so there are these guides, almost like a BuzzFeed quiz you would take today, like, which Disney character are you? This would be, which unreliable husband are you, based on your head shape? And it says, the reason this man is unreliable husband is because he is very weak in conjugality and parental love, and exceedingly strong in amativeness, which is like amorous, like lust or sexuality, right? Um, and if you look at it, it's purposely ethnicized based on stereotypes of the time period. Um, and I even went back and pulled out little snippets from that dictionary of races or people that we looked at earlier. Um, and it talks about the Southern Italian head shape, the long headed, dark Mediterranean race of short people. And then um, looking at the Jewish nose, right, the hooked nose of these stereotypes, right? So it's, it's, it is equating, even though technically it looks white to our eyes, this is equating an ethnicized, racialized version of sexuality right here. Um, while a genuine husband 
has this head shape. So if you have this head shape, congratulations. Um, because young ladies should indelibly fix the shape of head in your memories. Any man who will make a natural, kind, and true husband will have a head and outline from a side view like this. And this is like an Anglo personification of virtue and values and marital felicity, right? Because you can kind of see that going on there. Um, and we'll go, if I have time, I'll go back to that. So these are silly to us now, but I wanted to show it as an example of sort of, I made that, I made the BuzzFeed joke, the BuzzFeed quiz, but these are sort of like the quotidian ways, the everyday ways that people are learning about race. They're learning about sexuality. They're learning about romance, etc. It's in newspapers, books, um, even starting to show up in like school textbooks, etc. cetera. Um, and so when you start talking about picture brides in the news, we know now, right, that nothing is, everything is political, right? We know that you might be talking about marriage, but we see how politically loaded that is. And so my project is looking at the ways that certain words act as like codes, like code language, um, for races, for sexuality, for deviancy, etc. So how do you communicate these things? And there are a lot of different um, uh, comparison pieces. Um, but this one was about two kinds of brides, the American bride and the immigrant picture bride. Um, and the American bride, um, there is, um, I can read the quote to you because I have it because I took notes, because I am a good presenter, and then I forgot about them. Um, uh, so it starts this article, quote, it therefore is a little difficult to get the viewpoint of a bride who crosses oceans to be met at the dock by a man holding her photograph in his hand, a man whom she never saw before, but who is to be her companion through life. Remember, nothing in the world is so personal as marriage to the American mind. Okay, And they go on to say that this idea of marrying a man you've never met before is enough to make a, an American girl's heart stop, literally, her heart stop. Um, and we see here in this language these ideas of eugenics because Anglo, right, whiteness um, is shaped um, by impressibility. Right? They're more um, affected emotionally by things. Um, they learn quicker. They're stronger, etc. Um, and so women are physically, when they say a, a girl's heart stop, I don't think anybody thinks they're going to die of a heart attack, but it's this like expression of how angsty that makes white women feel to even think about it. Meanwhile, there's all of this obsession about how stoic Japanese women are. They say it's a quiet acceptance of fate, right? Um, and there's like, you even have this nice picture of this um, like Anglo looking woman who is sort of being policed by this man, right? He's staying between the two of them and this stoic looking woman kind of like walking down the gangplank. Up here is the immigration official at the dock who makes sure they get remarried according to American standards and rules and regulations, which is complicated, but um, again, so policing them, right? Standing between the sexual deviancy. So part of what I need to go back to is why Americans, again, all these terms are loaded, had such a problem with picture marriage is that idea of free choice, but it's also deeply rooted in nativist aggression. So they are seeing um, Japanese women coming over as this like unethical subversion of immigration restrictions. But basically, it's a group of people who are getting um, worked up over resources, um, job opportunities, et cetera, that there is no real competition over, right? But we tend to create scapegoats when people start panicking. Sound familiar? Um, and um, so there is all of this discourse in the newspaper about how picture marriage is akin to slavery because these women come over and they labor in the fields for their husband. They're like beasts of burden. Um, it's like prostitution, akin to prostitution, because these men are buying them by buying their tickets over or like giving them money to come over. Um, and it's seen as drudgery, etc. It also bucks up against ideas of white middle class domesticity, right? 
So women who are supposedly supposed to be in the home, right, according to conservative views, um, they are the center of the family. They raise the children to be good um, citizens, etc. So what does it say about groups of people whose wives are working beside them in the field? And so if we use sort of these ideas of eugenics, right, um, in our mind and we read these images and we read um, these descriptions, we can see things like this woman right here. Um, these are the, the, it says the cute picture brides photographed in Japan. And then this is them after. And it says how the pretty Jap picture bride looks after she begins to work as a field laborer. And she's masculinized. Remember that sort of idea of sexual inversion and gender um, switching. She's masculinized by her labor and she's physically darkened by the sun, right? That's like a symbolic and a physical um, darkening. Um, and she is, it says, mama working in a garden patch. And they're um, talking about how they're not good mothers because they leave their kids in these dirty pens, etc. So it's very inflammatory. And what happens is picture bride, therefore itself, becomes a trope in the newspaper. It becomes a symbol of what is wrong with immigration or the threat of immigration, right? And Japanese communities fight against this, right? Um, there's a lot of agency. I wish I had more time to talk about these stories. Um, but eventually, again, in 1920, they get um, sort of excluded from the country. But what's interesting, and this is where sort of um, my work adds to the history here, is that um, Greeks start coming over, and there are, do I have it? Yeah, a 1920 San Francisco headline. So this one, um, remember how they're Japanizing California. This is a few months before this headline in a 1920 San Francisco headline, who is hailing the arrival of the picture brides from Europe. Um, who are now taking the place of the now prohibited oriental picture brides of Japan. And they're saying it's a fair deal to foreign girls. And they're celebrating them because they're opening up a thriving industry in mat uh, matrimonial agencies and seaport towns. They're giving, um, they're furnishing children for the mill owner so the mill owner can produce more. Um, and they're contributing to the economy, et cetera. Um, and Japanese. Americans are, of course, clued in immediately to the hypocrisy of what's going on, right? Um, and this is one of my favorite letters. It shows up in the New York Times. They publish it um, from a person named G.K. Hatchie. I don't know if it's a man or a woman talking. Um, but they write, when Japanese residing in this country were marrying through the exchange of pictures, some Americans severely attacked the method. They said that marriage should not or should be based on love, and therefore Japanese marrying by pictures were running counter to the American ideal of marriage. Now, picture brides from near eastern countries are swarming to this side of the Atlantic. Where are those Americans who bitterly attacked Japanese picture brides but a few years ago? Why do they not come out and declare war against this new invasion of picture brides? And in a, like this wonderful sting, um, the writer calls them pseudo-Puritans, which I think is wonderful. Um, but he's like, these pseudo-Puritans, so these ideologies of love, of marriage, of free choice, are not actual, um, well, debatable, but they're, they're not um, meant... Um, literally, what they are is they're like a facade for America's racist agenda, right? Um, yeah, pseudo-Puritans. Um, and so, um, what I said earlier um, about it not just being as simple as white and non-white is that in this time period, um, because we have today's conception of what whiteness is, it's sort of this like mess of people, right? Um, <clears throat> is very different from how early 20th century people were um, discussing um, and um, conceptualizing race. So Greeks and Southern Europeans coming to the United States are white enough to get in, right? They're not policed like Chinese immigrants who are excluded or Japanese migrants, for instance. So they're able to come in, um, but they're not popularly considered white. They're almost off-white. And that's a term that scholars use, off-white or probationary white, um, because they are seen as different. And part of this comes from this idea, Henry Pratt Fairchild says this in 1911, 
that it's because of the checkered career of the Greek race in the last 20 centuries, with admixtures of foreign blood from Asia Minor, right? Because Turkey came in, the Ottoman Empire came in, um, and conquered Greece for a while, for hundreds of years, meaning. Um, and other people, Madison Grant and his passing of the Great Race book, Hitler's Bible that I just talked about, so the Mediterranean race is so far from being purely European, it is equally African and Asiatic. So if we think about picture marriage and arranged marriage, which, isn't, which is not uncommon for Anglo-Americans too. Uh, has anybody read like Sarah Plain and Tall when they were mm -hmm. a kid? Right, that's a, that's a story about like good old Americans and the homeland, Midwest, prairies getting married by mail, right? Picture marriage itself was not uncommon. Italians were doing it, Armenians were doing it, Koreans, um, Chinese and lesser numbers, Japanese, etc. right? Um, but the idea is only certain groups are being called picture brides. So while the practices might be a little bit different from like group to group, the idea, because remember how picture bride, in accordance to like Japanese women, becomes this code word. It has this all it packs a punch of meaning, right? You can get all of these ideas of like white nationalism and the danger of immigration just from like um, conjuring up the spectral picture bride in like uh, propaganda pieces. When you apply it to certain groups, it's an automatic like racialization of that group. It's saying they're different. It's saying they're somehow un-American, etc. And so um, we see this in the news coverage. Um, and there are, so all of these pieces that are comparing Japanese to Greeks, right? And Greeks are like the most predominant um, uh, group doing it in um, Southern Europe. Um, but what happens is you see the news coverage, how they're describing Greek picture marriage to be sort of in accordance with their racial position. It's not quite American, but it's not Japanese. So where does it fall between? And it's sort of this litmus test for who is white, who is not white, and how do these people fit in? Um, and so in um, the coverage, a lot of it talks about this like aggressive male Greek stereotype of like violent passions and gambling. Um, here's an old picture of like Utah miners that got dressed up and they have like their bottles of alcohol and they're holding guns. So it's a part of a much bigger picture, um, but it's sort of like this uh, communicating this Greek masculinity, right, in the new world. And you see these stereotypes being projected into these accounts of these picture bride women coming over. Because Greek men are very aggressive. They're like almost sexually um, like aroused by these women coming in. And they rush the docks. Like they break down gates and police have to be called. And they talk about them like surrounding. Like they won't wait for women to get off the boat. They get in their like little dory boats. And they like surround the boats almost as if they're like sharks going after prey, right? Um, and uh, there's um, other articles um, about Jawbreaker, Greek Jawbreaker, Greek game, and picture brides here on Liner. And the whole thing is like, these women are coming over on this boat, yada yada, this is what they look like, this is what they're wearing. Oh, and also on the same ship, these men, these Greek men in steerage, they almost got quarantined for an outbreak of mumps until officials figured out they were just playing a game called Jawbreaker where they are, it sounds like something on like MTV's Jackass, where they are literally like pounding each other in the face, jaws, until the last person is left standing because everybody else is like passing out. And so they are coming, they're arriving to Ellis Island with these big swollen jaws and they're all like bruised. And so they think it's like an epidemic in steerage, but no, it's just Greek men being crazy, right? Um, and um, so uh, here's one that talks about a caveman scheme to kidnap a bride, where this young man um, named Nikolai comes to pick up his, his bride, right, at Ellis Island, except, right, instead of like marrying her right then and there at Ellis Island, um, he wants to take her to Coney Island on a date. But that's scandalous, right? Because all sorts of things can go wrong at Coney Island date night. 
Um, and so the Traveler's Aid Society steps in, and the caveman scheme is like abolished or whatever, and it testifies how these people need to be policed and how the Traveler's Aid Society is necessary, et cetera, et cetera, and they're patting themselves on the back, right? Um, and again, here's more caveman um, imagery. So love at first sight, kind of an idea. Um, there's something like ativi ativistic. I, I don't know if I said that right. Yes, people are saying it for me. Um, something like backwards or um, like uh, like reversing evolution um, in these like sexual desires and these ways of mating. Um, but what happens? is there's a time period then, right, where Japanese picture brides are, um, like, for all intents and purposes, are banned from the country. And what happens is with each increasing immigration restriction, Anglo nativists in the United States and politicians making these laws relax just a little bit. Not much, but just a little bit because things are being policed. So what you see is when you have these Japanese women stopping, the sentiment in California kind of like deflates ever so slightly. There's still a lot of violence, as we know. But all of a sudden, it gives room, right, for these off-white picture brides to come in and be more accepted. And so what we see is an increasing attention to the romance of picture marriage. So it changes. And so what I said earlier about sexology and eugenics and romance, if we see romance all of a sudden coded into these descriptions of picture marriage, what is it? Well, it's a whitening, right? It's an Americanizing of these unions. Again, code language is important. So they're bringing candy with them. They're bringing flowers with them. They're um, in beautiful suits with like uh, flowers in their buttonholes. And the women named Helen and Mary, right? These like Christian names um, are um, coming and they're, they're clean and beautiful and they're ready for them. Um, here's a quote. There's, um, the, this is the experience of several hundred men who met the picture brides on the King Alexander, which is like a big ocean liner coming over from Greece. There is romance and adventure in a courtship like that, and most women like that sort of thing. So as before, like a year before, it was enough to make a girl's heart stop. Um, girls like adventure now, right? And picture marriage is just an adventure. It's a different type of courtship. And Greeks get a lot of political leverage by really working this. And they, from the very beginning, make sure to separate themselves out from Japanese practices. They are quick to say, we're not like them, right? They say here, the picture bride seems less a member of a third sex, which is really loaded if you're doing like queer readings of these things, talking about gender inversions, when the reason of her being is explained. <coughs> You must differentiate between the classes of picture brides. You must define your terms. So we are not them. And so it is like uh, Greeks are very um, proud to talk about how their women work in the home, right? Japanese women are out in the fields. Greek people follow strict standards of domesticity. They even write, um, I don't have it up here, they even write um, to uh, the government when they have um, uh, uh, when they start putting the quota systems in place, where it's like only a certain amount of immigrants can come from certain countries, Greeks in Chicago get together and they pen this um, big campaign. And one of their main points is, unlike Southern Italians and other immigrants, right, their women stay in the home and they respect their women and they have good families that contribute to society. Therefore, the quotas should not apply to them. And so what we see here is a strategy. And again, this is like the woman in the home who's helping him in his business, right? She's polishing the oranges. So like the beautiful parts of the fruit are seen out, right? As if she's like polishing away the blemishes of the Greek man um, so he, as he's becoming American. Um, and what happens then, and what's wrong with strategies like this is when groups, especially ethnic white groups, argue, I belong. I do this. I adhere to your standards of domesticity. That's not dismantling a system. You are, in fact, reinforcing that system of violence. You are becoming um, complicit in that system. And so um, 
part of what this project ultimately talks about is how so many groups in fighting for their own rights inherently exclude people, inherently exclude LGBTQ people or people of color or people with disabilities, etc. Right? Um, and so um, this, and I, I, this is so much information that I'm giving you all at once, so I'm hoping that it's, it's like you're following with me here. Um, but we have like ethnic group uh, festivals, like who has been to a Greek festival here? If you're a fan of Euros, on behalf of my people, you are welcome. Um, and we celebrate them, right? Um, and if there is a Greek woman in on the supermarket and she's speaking Greek, um, there's not normally, usually, going to be a white nationalist who says, speak American, speak English, right? But that behavior is directed towards Mexican or South American um, uh, migrants or people or Americans in the United States, right? It is um, uh, um, projected towards uh, people of Asian um, in, uh, heritage, etc. Sorry, I'm uh, confusing all my words. Um, and what happens is we see whiteness as political. Whereas certain groups were excluded in a certain time period um, for instance, when African Americans in the 1920s start migrating out of the South um, because of Jim Crow terror and all the violence down there, they want to get their families away, they want to start over again, they start um, migrating to the North, and guess what happens to white neighborhoods? Suddenly those Greeks, who were so not white last week, all of a sudden seem a lot white. They pale in comparison, metaphorically and literally, to the black African American people coming into your neighborhood. And so all of a sudden these privileges, like people are being brought into a club, an exclusive club, um, based on the, um, predicated on the exclusion of others. And so what we happen to have is ethnic whiteness, right? The Italian Americans, the Greek Americans, etc., cetera, um, who are an acceptable deviation from whiteness. You got this like blank Anglo-Americanness, um, and this is why it's okay for some groups um, to celebrate pizza and lasagna, and that's like kind of stereotypical, but um, like ideas and popular culture references to, it, uh, to Italy, and um, Greeks can dress up in our traditional um, uh, wear, um, and we can have Greek flags in um, the streets and celebrate culture, whereas other groups cannot, racialized groups. Does that make sense? Sort of, vaguely, et cetera. Okay. Um, and so, moving on from this history, we can, even though it's specific to these picture bride women and their partners, and it's specific to a certain time period and certain like geopolitical connections, I'm hoping that you can sort of glean some of these um, code words, some of these strategies, right? Some of these intersectional ideas of race, gender, and sexuality into the contemporary moment. Um, you have picture brides, which are uh, critiques of reproduction, critiques of um, their non-whiteness, their racialization, critiques of their sexuality or their prostitution or whatever. We see that in ideas of the welfare queen, right? That is racialized, that is sexualized. She's mooching off the government. She has um, 10 different babies from 10 different dads, etc. right? And it's always like, not always, but a lot of the times it's directed the stereotype at black women. That same exact thing is not same exact thing. I, I, I hesitate to do that, but that same strategy has existed for a long time and has its purpose is to say certain people should be excluded, that they do not have the right to be here, that they are not legitimate citizens. The idea of anchor babies, which gets applied sometimes to Asian migrants, but a lot of times to like uh, Central and South American migrants, is all about uh, non-white reproduction and um, subversion of immigration restrictions, right? Just like the picture right ideas. So I'm hoping, if anything, whether you agree with these ideas or not, that you are more clued into the world around you, that you are looking at these headlines with a different eye or a more nuanced eye to these strategies. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric that's talking about illegal um, immigration. And we have a president and his advisors 
and people in Congress saying that illegal immigration is at its highest it's ever been. And they're hyping up a crisis of non-white people who are coming in and taking our jobs and taking and having anchor babies left and right. There was a declaration this morning, I don't know if you saw the headlines, where Trump wants to take away birthright citizenship. Meaning, um, if you're born in the United States, you're a U.S. citizen. He right. wants to repeal that based specifically off of Southern American, Central American, Mexican migration into the United States. And by executive order. And by executive order, and right? Unconstitutional. Unconstitutional, yes. yes. Thank you. Um, and what I want you guys to realize um, is looking at the numbers, right? If we're looking at sort of the facts of it, illegal migration or undocumented migration, we don't have, um, like, it's not possible to figure out exact numbers. How it's always been figured out is how many, like, apprehensions that they get um, or people, like, um, imprisoned or caught or sent back, etc. Those numbers are what has predicated our ideas of how many people are coming in and out um, without valid or legitimate means. Um, and we are actually at an all-time low, which is surprising. So some of these people are right in the fact that maybe October or maybe August 2018 did have more people coming in than August 2017, but it comparatively has um, much less than 2014, than 2012 here, 2010, etc. So immigration is a game of who's in, who's out, uh, what color people are, what orientation people are, um, and what's my next? Okay, I have other things. Um, but basically, we need to be more aware of these things. So I'm gonna wrap it up there. Because I would like to have a discussion with you all. I would love questions, etc. I would love to hear what you think about this, maybe your own stories, etc. cetera. And um, thank you for coming. And we'll go ahead and open it up to discussion. I think you're pointing out the, the difference in viewpoint towards picture brides that were white versus those that were not mm -hmm. or perceived as not. It was really interesting because, you know, in the old West, that was really, really common, the mail order bride. Yes. And you could and and I haven't realized before, but when you were pointing out that there was this romanticization, uh, you know, that, that it's this romantic thing that this person's lonely and waiting for the, the woman of their dreams. Their so lonely that, swings. Yes, yes. exactly. And I, I just had never realized that before, but I can see how that would make the perception be different. Exactly. So, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think one of the main points, ultimately, is that we call out the hypocrisy of it. So it's not just a story of like, oh, they were white, they were more accepted, they're not white, whatever. But the fact that you have similar practices with totally disparate experiences, and that's hypocritical. Yeah. That's not what we think America is. That's not what we think democracy or egalitarianism is or freedom is. That's hypocrisy. And so it questions these idea of whiteness, of privilege, et cetera, that we have. It makes us more attuned to um, how there are double standards existing in society. Do you think these, and this is all great, do you think this extends to today with things like online dating, um, like some of these principles and stuff that we're talking about? I'm just trying to think of like, you know, yeah. okay, well, what does picture brides look like today in 2018? And yeah. Match. Especially com, with like, first thing. yeah, <laughs> on, yeah, match.com. I, I, I yeah, I don't, yeah, all of them. Um, it, it is really interesting. Um, the dynamic has changed right after World War II, it changes. Um, but a lot of that is because of like the different um, ethnic groups. Um, but also, a lot of times now, these male order brides, what we call them, it would be like, um, like a white man in Nebraska, for instance, getting a woman from like Eastern Europe or Thailand, etc. So there's like different interesting ideas of like race um, going on there. And also, um, 
different ideas of privilege too. So in, back in the day, picture brides, they were marrying men from their home countries. And they might have been like better off because they're in the new country or they're in America. Um, but there is a sort of that like ethnic connection. A lot of times they were people from your home village or they like served with your brother in the Balkans war, right? So there's some sort of like idea and connection there. Um, whereas like the mail order bride is today, it's, it's different, it's, but it's still like a global um, relationship. I, that's gonna be like a second or third book is like bringing us really into the present of... Um, Were there ever any instances of men being brought over or was it only women? I have never found one. But there is like a lot of, um, that's a good question. She, I don't know if you heard that, if there are um, instances of men or women bringing men over. I've never heard that. Um, a lot of times it's because of gender roles. We're really strict. Um, and uh, like for instance, Greek women rarely traveled by themselves. Um, it was like only after like a group of like Greek men had sort of established themselves in the United States that they start bringing Greek women over. Um, uh, there are like Irish immigrants were that was like one of the few waves of immigrants that were predominantly women they didn't really have this history of arranged marriages or at least um, bringing people over on arranged marriages uh, but there is like a lot of remarkable agency that these women have coming over it's a scary process right um, because like your morals might be questioned because you're coming over and you're you know like arranged marriage I'm not trying to say that it's this like wonderful um, thing that works every time. It's scary. It was scary for them, too. I have a, a file um, from the National Archives, an immigration file of a woman who sits down to be interviewed by the immigration official. She's a Greek woman, and she says, send me home. She's like, send me back. I don't want to be here. Send me home. And so she's looking for any excuse to be like put back because she wants to stay home. Because a lot of times it's like your dad tells you to go do it, so you do it. A lot of women would um, become nuns. They would run away from home and become nuns so they didn't have to go to America. Other women wanted desperately to go. It was adventurous. It was fun. They did want to start their own families. Their, their family in Greece maybe were poor. And in 1922, I have this wonderful um, article about a Greek woman who comes over and gets completely screwed over by this guy who brought her over, and she sues him. And she actually wins a lot of money, like alimony and stuff, from him in court. Um, so again, the media tried to make it seem like these are like victims, these women are like passive or um, like accepting of their fates, but they were also active agents in their lives. And um, yeah, showed a lot of moxie. Um, the image of the sign with the anchor babies or mm -hmm. the Welcome Queen, like that made me think of how in so in the past with the picture bride phenomenon, like how babies and fertility fits into the picture like family size. Like was there any propaganda or language related to having children? Oh absolutely. Yeah. Especially in um, if we're talking about Japanese migration. Um uh, white nativists and even like European immigrants too in the West, um, part of why they were so threatened by picture marriage is it meant that men were now settling in the United States. Japanese men were settling because they had families, right? That they weren't these temporary migrants. A lot of Chinese workers would come over, work on the railroads, go back. Mexican workers are the same thing. There's been this steady like up until like we have these strict border restrictions, there's been like the steady flow of workers who come in um, seasonally um, and help with the economy. Um, but uh, with Japanese women coming over, all of a sudden you're seeing family units. Um, and California does alien land laws where they say if you, because uh, Asians are ineligible for citizenship at this time period. So it is very racial. They are not allowed to become citizens unless they're born here. So you have these Issei, these first generation Japanese people who it's illegal for them to own land. And so what they do, they're super smart and they're like, okay, I'll put it in my kid's name. He's a citizen. Well, then that like only adds like fuel to the fire. Um, and so uh, again, there's a lot of ideas um, about um, birth rates. Like the United States and congressional reports and committees really want to know just how many um, babies these immigrants are having. 
Um, and there's this like uh, studies and books that are being published about how um, Japanese people have already taken over Hawaii. They're going to take over the West Coast. They're Japanizing California. And that has to do with their uh, supposedly hyper fertility. Because in this time period, eugenics um, says that um, non white people were hyper fertile. Um, and that's why it was so threatening to white women because they were out producing them. Um, and it's, it's, it's total propaganda. You can actually see statistics from the time period, and they're very almost equal. Um, so yeah, they, that fertility was really targeted, um, especially with like land, being able to own land in your child's name and citizenship, etc. You're primarily talking about your rides on the West Coast, but was that throughout America too? Um, yes. So that's actually a really good question that I should have um, explained, clarified earlier. So Japanese picture brides are mainly coming in through Angel Island, which is the immigration station um, right in San Francisco. It's like the Ellis Island of the West, except conditions were much worse, detention periods of immigration were much longer, etc. Um, and so they're coming in predominantly through the West Coast, sometimes through Canada, sometimes up from Mexico, right? Like circumventing where they can come in. And these European um, women are coming into the East Coast. So that's why there's a lot of coverage in like New York newspapers um, that are being um, reproduced throughout the country's newspapers. Um, but they're coming in. So it's this interesting ideas of like East Coast and West Coast and the different cultures that um, uh, exist there as well. But they're in communication with each other, right? So West Coast newspapers are talking about these Greek women. East Coast newspapers are covering all of like the political drama of the West, and they're comparing each other. And so um, part of what my project talks about is that picture brides weren't just um, sort of like an odd history that Greeks had or these Southern Europeans had, but they're actually like central to their histories, to their foundational American stories, and that they're connected. Because usually in immigration studies, um, Asian immigrants and European immigrants are almost segregated, as if they're like two different histories. Just because they're two different coasts, um, they don't have much to do with each other. And then this project brings them in and says, you know what? These like political boundaries like are closer than we think. They overlap in interesting ways. And that white ethnic history is predicated on how America treated it's non-white citizens. So, um, in those signs, like, I've, I've usually heard of anchor babies refer to, like, Latino women. Mm -hmm. And then the other signs is no birth tourism. But there are women, right, from other countries that come and have their babies and then go back. Or is that wrong? Yes. So, um, are you just asking if the phenomenon exists? Or, or just, like, um, I guess the politics. What they distinguish as like a birth tourism versus an anchor baby. The anchor baby, and see, maybe I can't speak as well to that since it's more of a contemporary moment thing. And I've been so like steeped in my um, historical research. But sort of the idea of an anchor baby is that it's a reason to stay, literally like anchor, right? Um, and that it is a subversion of the system. Whereas like birth tourism, you can come in and pop in and out. Um, but the whole... Um, the idea why people get upset about anchor babies is it's allowing, right? It's given certain privileges and resources to people that they claim should not have them. And so I think that, that is the difference. Just like with Japanese picture brides, it means that these ethnic people are settling and creating families and owning property, etc. And that signals like this sort of like fear of competition and white aggression. I'm the same thing with anchor babies. All of a sudden our our resources are being put into these people who illegally cross in, etc. So it's the idea that these people are settling that I think gets people really upset. I hope that makes sense. And I, I could be wrong. I'll look more into it. I'll, I need to learn more about it. What are the ages of anyone that is Um They are anywhere from, and you can see on this picture, they're anywhere from like 14 to 15. Um, see how young she looks right here? To like 30s. 
So some of the older women who are at home um, who don't have like marriage opportunities because a lot of men, like there's a big diaspora happening, right? A lot of people are leaving Greece, leaving Greece because of like war or like poverty, etc. So they're left without marriage options. So some of them lie about their age and say they're younger um, or um, whatever. Um, and the men, the Greek men um, in particular, who are in the United States are ones that have had to sort of rise up the economic ladder enough to be able to support a wife. And what they do is they don't get married in this time period until they can take care of their sister's dowries a lot of times. Um, and so there's this like familial piety. So you have like Greek men who are like 35, 40, 45 who are marrying these very young Greek women. And so there's like drastic age gaps a lot of time between them. And they also send on both all kinds of picture rights, no matter your ethnic or whatever. There's all sorts of like fudging pictures, just like your match.com profile makes you look really good and thin, you know, and you like have your puppy and looking cute. Um, they did the same thing. They airbrushed themselves, right? They would like scratch off things. Um, sometimes you would send a picture of your younger, more attractive brother. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you would send a picture from like 10 years ago. Sometimes they would have like birthmarks on their face. So all of a sudden what you would have at the camera is like your good side, right? And there were some women who came over and went, nope, and went back home. <laughs> They're like, this is not what was advertised for one reason or another, right? Whether you didn't have the home or the resources or the community standing that you said you had or you're much older, etc. So women did absolutely um, uh, uh, practice their rights. Um, Japanese women, they got married by proxy at home, so the marriage was already done a lot of the times, but there was a phenomenon of women saying, no, this is not right, or this it's some if it was beyond um, what they could handle, they would leave and often would marry other men. Um, and so there was, by no means were these women like defenseless victims. I'm not quite sure how I got to that, but did I answer your original question? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Rachel? Can you hear me? Yes, I absolutely okay. can. Um, I know that your research mainly focuses on like ethnic marriages, but have you looked at American men who seek out picture rights from other countries and how these stereotypes of docility and femininity play into those marriages? Yeah, so are you talking in the like, early 20th century or contemporary moments? Whatever. Yeah. So in the contemporary moment, I kind of think this like folds into what Blair was talking about. Like, how is this different from our contemporary notions of mail order brides? Mm -hmm. um, in the time period, what I'm really interested in looking at, if we're talking about like mixed marriages, mixed racial marriages, is another reason for Japanese picture marriage, where there were miscegenation laws in California that said you can't marry white people. People of different colors can't marry each other. So what are your different options? You can not get married or you can send for a picture bride, right? Um, and it wasn't as simple as that, but these miscegenation laws were in um, place. Um, and so there are um, Chinese and Japanese people who are marrying uh, African Americans. And there's also this sort of curiosity that opens up in newspapers where you have Asian men marrying white women and these articles are fascinating, and I'm including some of them in a chapter I haven't written yet, um, so bear with me. Um, but there's all of this like speculation and description of these women. These women are this tall, they have brown hair, brown eyes, large ears, or blah, 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 like to the different thing. And it's almost as if we're trying to figure out what kind of white woman would marry a Japanese man? And there's all of these things about like, maybe he's really wealthy and that's the reason why. It's very demeaning. It's very demeaning, it's very speculative. Um, and it speaks to that idea of like, why do people marry people of different ethnicities? Like, why is this, what are their offspring like? What are their reactions of their parents, etc.? So it's almost like a curiosity. This might be mixing two different issues, but um... I was curious about the notions of, or the ideas about assimilation as an ideal in this time period, because mm -hmm. it seems like there's also a lot of emphasis on 
racial purity mm -hmm. in terms of policy and cultural norms. So I wonder, I mean, I don't know if those are the same thing exactly. I mean, you yeah. could assimilate without <coughs> violating racial purity, I suppose, but I wonder how those, there's, if there's an Well, there. there's a couple different forms of assimilation. There's cultural assimilation, like you're assimilating to like the cultural beliefs, ideas, practices, and then there is that genetic um, assimilation. And Greeks, one of their biggest, I forgot to mention this, one of their biggest political strategies of saying why they belong in America, why they are good at democratic systems is because <laughs> they invented it, right? And so um, what, and again, these like nativist eugenicists are saying like, yeah, you might have invented it, but you've like interbreeded with Ottomans and Asiatics for a long time. You're not the same people. Um, but they really, it's called Hellenism, right? They recycled this ancient tradition and said, you know, this is our heritage, literally. And they use eugenics logic, right? The blood of democracy runs in our veins. So that's sort of their way of trying to assimilate, like, um, physically, genetically. But also um, by saying our women, even though we do have these cultural practices that are different, like picture marriage, our women come over, they work in the home, and that's an important part of assimilating to American domestic white middle class values. Our families, therefore, may start off Greek, but then we become American. Um, and that was really hit hard. Does that sort of answer that? Yeah. 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 The Greeks love talking about their heritage. So it was true in that time period, certainly. Well, yeah, thank you for this. It's uh, just terrific work in every way. Um, and well, I have more than one question, but I will, uh, you know, go overboard here. But um, um, I'm interested in, uh, you know, the impact of um, some of these uh, currents on on the West. You know, you, you mentioned uh, Nebraska, which is. Uh, sort of the West and sort of not, and then there's Utah. Um, I know that uh, I had some some friends in Wyoming who uh, uh, were from uh, their, their uh, grandparents came over from Greece and so on. So I was kind of wondering, uh, you know, what you could say about the impact of of uh, picture brides and, and, and Greek immigration in some of the various Western states, and um, also if there are any uh, popular culture representations of, of the picture bride phenomenon, either with uh, the Japanese uh, women or with, uh, with Greek women that uh, had an impact like novels, uh, fictionalized movies, anything like that. Because I could be wrong about this, but it seems like that the, the Greek immigrant experience to the United States hasn't gotten as much attention in mass culture as uh, Italian, uh, Irish, uh, Jewish, uh, from, from various parts of Europe. Uh, so, yeah. Anything in, in those two areas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is these are great questions. So the first one to dissect that one, talking about Greek immigrants coming to the West, the U.S. West, um, there are certainly many documented cases of that. And what's interesting is the United States government was weary of these picture brides coming over. They knew what was going on, um, and they were like fielding these interviews with people and making sure that they had the right credentials, et cetera, that these marriages were valid. And they would hire, like the Immigration Bureau would hire spies or like um, agents to travel them. And sometimes, because you have like um, maybe three or four women, maybe their sisters or cousins are all from the same village who are coming over at the same time to marry men. Um, uh, so maybe one man and his brothers or something like that. So one man will show up to Ellis Island, pick up these four women to take them back west, right, to get married. Well, that like smacks of prostitution and um, immoral going ons. Um, and so uh, travelers, uh, like agents um, in disguise, would follow these groups of Greeks all the way out to Utah, all the way out to Washington, which is really fascinating. 
But there, Utah, there was a huge community, especially in Salt Lake, of Greeks. Um, one of like the best archives of like Greek American history is at the University of Utah. Um, and um, some of the very, very first um, picture brides, uh, Greek picture brides coming over were early like 1900 to 1910 women that would go to the mining camps. And they would literally be like a lone female in like this huge camp of men. And they would sort of do like all the walk, like talk about like servant work. They would do all the washing, all of the emotional care of these communities of men. Um, and so there's that. Um, and there's lots of just like Greeks in Washington as well, some in San Francisco. Um, and so there are like even cases of Greek picture brides coming through Angel Island. So going, you know, through Asia over. Um, so yes, there's lots of interesting stories there. Um, and then in terms of um, popular culture, um, I have not found beyond newspapers um, in the time period itself, like 1900 to 1930, I haven't found any good novels or like fictional accounts. A lot of it, again, is newspapers or congressional discourses or legislation um, or immigration files that I'm working from. But there is like a ton of, like in the late 19th century, a ton of fascination with um, fiction on polygamy. Um, and that like actually figures into like the first Sherlock Holmes novel. And polygamy, I did have a slide and I didn't wanna, and this is the last question, I'll stop talking here in a little bit. Uh, but polygamy was also considered an Asiatic or Orientalized um, practice. And so when Mormons were doing it out west in Utah, um, it becomes like nationally like a, a joke or a running gag to racialize Mormons as white or as different, right? And so this was like a popular um, cartoon that came out where it says Mormon Elder Barry um, out with his six-year-olds who take after their mothers. And of course you have like the black, the Chinese, the Scottish, the um, Native American, right? All of these like racist depictions right there. Um, and it's because, again, just like saying Greeks are picture brides, it's racializing them. So if uh, Mormons are doing polygamy, it's racializing. So there's a lot of sort of um, Asian Orientalist um, infusions of the, these polygamy novels where like the heroine almost gets wrapped up into like a polygamous system, but at the last second escapes. Um, so I think those would be fascinating. But the um, Fictional depictions of picture brides are usually contemporary within the past 30 years. There's a really good one um, on Japanese picture brides. Um, it takes place in Hawaii. And um, about 10, 10 years ago or so, there was um, a pretty popular Greek movie called Me Face, which is the Greek word for brides, brides um, that was about a Greek picture bride on a boat um, with other women. Um, and it's really good. It's really, really good. And they like re, like they did a lot of research into their um, costumes and traditional like wedding gowns. And it's just, it's a lovely, very entertaining movie. Jeff, last question. Kansas also had an alien land law. Did it? It was passed in 1925. Care to guess when it was invalidated? 1980. 2002. Oh. Mm. 2002. It had not been enforced for several decades. There's one state that continues to have it in its state constitution. Florida, of course. Okay, I wouldn't have guessed Florida, but... You know, well, you should think about Florida man uh -huh. and stuff like that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to say on top of that. Shoot, it went out of my head. How did you start again? Uh, alien alien land land? Oh, Kansas. Okay, yeah, so Kansas. we're talking about like uh, weird, quirky histories of Kansas, and this mm -hmm. is what I'll finish on. So we're talking about eugenics in the 1920s. So in Kansas, at like state fairs, they mm -hmm. would have these contests called the Better Babies Contest, mm -hmm. where you would bring in literally a pedigree, like your ancestry, to show like your baby is like the most superior baby. Like it is white. It comes from a great heritage. Um, great genetics, it, it's, it's fat, it's ripe, it's good, you know, like it's healthy, it's pink, whatever. Um, and they would literally judge these babies based on their like eugenic greatness. So better baby contest. And do you know who one of the um, judges every year of better baby contest was? James Naismith. 
Yeah. So with that, I will say rock chalk. <laughs> um, and thank you all so much for coming. I think that there's still some drinks back there and snacks. Um, and have a great week.